In an era where Pokemon players are in constant competition to one-up themselves with harder and harder challenges, I decided to take things back to basics with a simple Pokemon Fire Red Nuzlocke. Because to me, the spirit of a Nuzlocke should be focused on the bond you create between yourself and those unlikely Pokemon you wouldn't have on your team otherwise, rather than extreme difficulty just for the sake of it. So starting the game, meet Ice Boil and Boil Cream, the first of the Boil dynasty. Now you might be wondering, why Ice Boil? Well, the answer's simple, random word generator. The concept of the Boil Dynasty came from myself and chat as I streamed every part of this Nuzlocke live right here on YouTube, and thus Boil Cream was born. Now the Nuzlocke doesn't start until we've delivered Oak's package and acquired Pokeballs, so once that had been completed, it was finally time to set off to acquire all eight gym badges, defeat the Elite Four, and expand the Boil Dynasty, starting with the encounters on routes 1, 2, 22, and Viridian Forest. Meet Boil Rat, Oil Boy, Oily Baba, and last but not least, Boiler Pill. Oil Boy quickly distinguished itself from the pack by soloing the first proper rival battle. Still, their moment in the spotlight wouldn't last long, as it was time to pass back to Boil Cream to remind the new starts where they were top brass of the Boil Dynasty by taking on the entire Pewter City gym without any assistance necessary. So with Brock defeated, it was back to expansion, with the additions of Super Boil, Hard Boiled, and B Snake Oil the last of which was wanted in three different regions for tax fraud, but somehow slithered their way onto our team. Having said that though, it was clear the team had its frontrunners, those being Boil Cream, leader of the Boil Dynasty, Oil Boy, Scourge of Viridian Forest, and Oily Bubba, champion of Mount Moon, as there wasn't a single trainer on our warpath that those three couldn't handle. Or at least I thought that was the case until tragedy struck, as Boil Cream, leader of the Boil Dynasty, took on any great mentor role, and died early on in our story, to an unknown Goldeen, right before the face-off against Misty. This was a crushing loss, as Boil Cream was supposed to make this gym a breeze, so with a grass-type gap in our team, it was time to leave the gym and seek out a new member. But we couldn't do that without having to face off against our rival first, which came with its own tragedy, as in order to protect Oil Boy from certain death, Hard Boil jumped in front of the way of the Charmander's scorching flames, sacrificing itself in the process. This sacrifice was not in vain, however, as Oily Baba was able to pick up the pieces and finish the job. Although Hard Boiled hadn't been a prominent member of the team, their loss would be felt, as I had big plans for them to solo the Vermilion City Gym, but that was a problem for another day, as after defeating our rival and pressing through Nugget Bridge, it was time for two new encounters. Meet Bead Royal and Oil Creme. Despite losing two of our members, we had already reached team capacity, so Bead Royal took the place of Boiler Pill, who went to join Super Boil in the box and Oil Creme had to live up to the lofty expectations left behind by Oil Cream and become the new star of the team. After a brief training montage, Oil Creme was ready, and with the team at maximum power, we charged headfirst back into Cerulean City Gym and initiated the remaining battle against Misty. Everything was going well, with Oil Creme swiftly defeating Misty's Staryu, but things started to go south when Starmie arrived and almost brought Oil Creme to ruin. However, Oil Creme wouldn't go down without a fight, and paralysed our foe before swapping out to safety behind Oil Boy. But we weren't in the clear just yet, as despite facing the Starmie on equal footing, a few good water pulses took Oil Boy to the brink, leaving us with very limited options on how to proceed. After assessing our options, I decided to switch out Oil Boy for Oily Baba, believing they would be able to deal a finishing blow, but it was all for naught, as once Oily Baba entered the field, it became clear that fate had other plans, as a single critical swift attack struck Oily Baba, taking them down in one go. This was another crushing loss, as I really saw Oily Baba making it all the way to the Elite Four, but now we'd never know. So as our pool of options became even smaller, we decided it was time for Beast Snake Oil to face judgement for their years of tax fraud, by sending them out as fodder to buy us time to heal Oil Creme. But unlike with Oily Baba, fate favoured Beast Snake Oil, as Starmie briefly succumbed to its paralysis, allowing the heal to go off without issue, and allowing Oil Creme to be switched back in once more. But just as things finally seemed to be going our way again, Stami used the one move we didn't expect, Recover, resetting all our progress back to zero. But that wasn't all, as the very next turn, Stami landed another heartbreaking critical, which proved too much for Oil Creme to handle, losing the team its new ace. Almost out of options, B Snake Oil and B Droil volunteered as sacrifices against the Stami to allow Oil Boy one last chance to heal. Unfortunately, we only had basic potions left, so Oil Boy still wasn't running at full capacity. However, fate swung once again in our favour as Paralysis kicked in, allowing Oil Boy to reach full health once more. Based on Oil Boy's first encounter with the Starmie, 
I knew their moves wouldn't deal enough damage to end things quickly, so instead I took a gamble on lowering the foe's accuracy in the hopes of gaining more turns, but it soon became even clearer that the odds were not in our favour, as Oil Boy, the scourge of Viridian Forest, fell to the Starmie's attack. This was it. It all came down to Boil Rat. With the strength of all who came before pushing her forward, she was ready to take on this insurmountable foe. And my word, you are about to witness one of the greatest comebacks in the history of Pokemon battles. Let's go! Watch Borat clutch. Me when I lie. So the team got wiped out and things were not looking good. There were no more encounters left, so we had only two options left. One, restart the Nuzlocke. Or two, train the last surviving members of the Boyle Dynasty with the sole purpose of avenging their fallen comrades. Chat voted on option two, so it was time to train. And by train, I mean call up my uncle who works at Nintendo for a shipment of rare candies. But with that said, it was time to return to face Misty and gain vengeance for the Boyle Dynasty. The strategy was simple. Boiler Pill would put the Staryu to sleep and chip down its health to bait the Super Potion. Then, once the foe had been defeated, the strategy remained largely the same, but with one key difference. Once the insurmountable Starmie had been put to sleep, it was time to switch to Super Boil to use a barrage of super effective pursuits to finally topple the warmonger who nearly ended everything. And as you can see, although incredibly close, modern day Joseph Joestar and Caesar Zabelli took revenge once and for all. But this adventure wasn't over yet, as with the Boil Dynasty reduced to ashes, it was time to rebuild. Now a lot has happened since the tragedy of Cerulean City. Mainly, two more gym leaders have been defeated, and many new allies have been gained. Meet Flambe, Bed and Breck, Ground Beef, Toaster, and Tenderize. You may have realised, what happened to the naming convention? Well simply put, after the loss of nearly all our comrades, Chat and I decided to leave things in the past, and start with a new naming convention. Can you guess what it was? No? Well, in short, it was anything surrounding a kitchen, whether that be cooking techniques or ingredients used. Your next question might be, what happened to Boiler Pill? Well, that's an easy one to answer, as Boiler Pill had officially declared their retirement from the team and were currently relaxing on a beach in Fiji. Super Boil was still going strong, bringing us a decisive victory against Erica, and our new members were no pushovers either, as Ground Beef successfully held their own against the might of Lieutenant Surge, and Flambe, Bed and Breck, and Toaster were just all round powerhouses. Toaster especially, because despite being level 40, they still hadn't evolved yet and instead opted to do the Voltorb equivalent of a handstand. Tender Eyes had yet to prove themselves, but their time would come soon enough. We had made it all the way through Silph Co and were ready to face off against Giovanni. We had made it this far without losing anyone since the tragedy, but all that was about to change. Yeah, we've got lovely weather today. It's like, I've got clear blue skies and no, my goodness, ground beef. I look outside, look back and ground beef dead. Wow, I did not see that coming at all. I guess that's what happens when you get crit, right? With a ground beef shaped hole in our hearts, we quickly finished off Giovanni's Nido Queen and began the search for a new member. Fortunately, it wouldn't be long until we found one, as before we could even leave Silphco, a man stopped us in our tracks and gave us a Lapras, whom we decided to name the most important thing of all. Water! Because we already had a water type through Flambe, I wasn't exactly sure how long Walter would stay on the team. Fortunately, they had a chance to prove themselves, as due to the self-imposed level cap, we were unable to use Flambe until after we had beaten Koga, as he had gone past level 43, meaning there was a spot for a water type on the team. With all that said though, it was now time to take on the objectively best gym leader in Kanto, Sabrina. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Superboil was OG. Superboil brought us back from the brink with Misty's gym. No, a crit! That loss stung Superboil, one half of the duo that saved the Nuzlocke, and Servibus, a new flame that never had the chance to shine, taken out so early was nothing short of another tragedy. Toaster, still unevolved by the way, managed to claw back the win by overcoming their confusion, tanking multiple Psybeams, surviving an enemy Hyper Potion, and doing all this while being locked into performing rollout. But that was for the best as after finally defeating the Venomoth, Rollout had built enough power to one-shot Mr. Mime and Alakazam, claiming vengeance on behalf of their fallen brothers. So after mourning the tragic losses that occurred during our stay in Saffron City, 
it was time to face Koga, but not before another training montage and acquiring new members. Meet Chef and Omelette. Chef was a gift Pokemon we received all the way back in Celadon City. We were unsure as to what their role on the team would be, so at this stage, we just kept them as a bench warmer. Omelette, however, had big shoes to fill. We caught them during our ascent of Pokemon Tower and brought them onto the team in the hopes that they would live up to the ground beef legacy. And with a resistance to poison, taking on Koga gave them the perfect opportunity to prove themselves. Walter opened the fight and proved themselves to be a force to be reckoned with by one-shotting the first coughing and forcing Koga to use a Hyper Potion on Muck. But all that battling took its toll as Muck steadily increased its defense and evasion, needing Walter to be switched out. At this point, I would have bought in Bed and Breck, but like with Flambe, they too had gone over the level gap. So instead, I chose Toaster. This was a costly mistake, however, as Toaster didn't do nearly enough damage as expected and succumbed to the Muck's poison attacks. No! That, that hurts, that hurts. Toaster was a community favorite member of the team and one I truly believed would be with us right up until the end. But clearly it wasn't to be. My only regret is that I never got to see them evolve, a sentiment shared by the rest of the community. But as much as we wanted to lament the loss of our friend, we weren't out of the woods just yet. And so it was finally Omelette's time to shine. And shine they did, as after a bit more trouble, they finally put an end to Koga's muck and tanked a full explosion from the remaining coffin, nearly yielding to the poison if it wasn't for the sheer luck of being able to be swapped out before the damage took effect. Weezing was going to be a Pokemon nearly impossible to take down due to the overall strength of the team, but I had one last resort I was reluctant to use unless things were looking dire, but now seemed like the perfect time. Bending the rules a bit, I switched to Bed and Breck as my logic was simple. I can't use Bed and Breck to battle, but I can use them to stall with items. So I used my newfound time to heal Walter, swap them in to use Perish Song, and then swap back to Bed and Breck to stall out the timer, sparing Walter and forcing the Weezing to fall to Perish Song's guaranteed knockout effect. Although one could argue it was a cheap victory, it was either that or risk losing the entire team once more, something I wasn't prepared to gamble on. Speaking of gambling, I lost all our money at the casino, trying to gather enough points to afford a Dratini before the Elite Four. But that was ultimately a waste of time, as shortly after entering the Safari Zone, we encountered one, which after catching on the first ball, named Linguini, who, spoiler alert, never got used on the team, meaning I wasted all our money for nothing. But perhaps the luck of a Dratini was one last gift from Toaster, who after putting them to rest, the team and I vowed not to lose another member from that point on. Now that the level cap had been increased, Flambe was back on the team, and they were looking better than ever as they proceeded to solo Blaine's gym. And Ben and Breck wasn't looking to be left behind either, as they took on Giovanni's gym single-handedly as well. This meant the only thing that stood in our way from completing this Nuzlocke was the Elite Four, and after one long trek through Victory Road, we were ready. Introducing Flambe, Terror of the Deep, Walter, Herald of Death, Chef, the Final Flame, Omelette, Curse of the Land, Bed and Breck, Lord of Might, and finally, Tender Eyes, the Silent Omen. Lorelei, Bruno, and Agatha were all fairly straightforward fights, that just came down to working our tight matchups and exploiting weaknesses effectively. It was once we reached the final member of the Elite Four Lance that things became sticky. The main Pokemon we were scared of was this Gyarados and its Hyper Beam. Luckily, this was finally, after all this time, Tenderize's chance to prove themselves. Up until now, Tenderize had always been out of the spotlight, happy to leave the claim of glory to our team's other members. But right now, this was his moment. Due to Gyarados's four times weakness to electricity, one swift thunder punch from Tenderize was expected to do the job, but unfortunately, it wasn't enough. The longer the fight dragged out, the clearer it was that Tenderize was beginning to struggle. But before we had any chance to strategize, Gyarados used Hyper Beam and defeated Tenderize in one go. But there was no time to mourn, as Flambe arrived on the field to give the enemy a taste of their own medicine by delivering a new Hyper Beam, bringing an end to the opening of this battle. The rest of the fight was manageable, with Walter's Ice Beam doing a good chunk of the heavy lifting, but now it was time to end things. In a shocking twist, Lance revealed to us that we had one more opponent to face, our rival, Akechi. You know, the guy who defeated Hardboiled about two minutes into the video, who I haven't mentioned since because they've been pretty much irrelevant this entire time. Well, they clearly didn't like being ignored because they were ready to put me on the ropes. Pidgeot, Rhydon, and Executor were all free, as Walter, Flambe, and Chef took down each one of their respective opponents in a single blow. Things didn't start getting difficult until Alakazam arrived on the field, 
as Flambe's bike couldn't deal enough damage. And what made things worse was that Alakazam knew recover, which meant the two Pokemon were effectively in a stalemate until one crit or changed tactic. Ultimately this choice came down to me, so instead of using Bite, once Alakazam's health was low enough, I got Flambe to use Hyper Beam, which took our foe down in one fell swoop. Keeping Flambe out on the field, it was time for another mirror match with Gyarados. The plan we had was simple. Despite only taking half damage to water, using two Hydro Pumps on the enemy, which would make them weak enough so that one Hyper Beam would finish them off. This plan almost cost us Flambe, as Hyper Beam was unable to deal enough damage, but Fortune smiled upon us, as the turn Flambe took to recover was the same turn Akechi chose to use a full restore. Not wanting to look a gift rapidash in the mouth, we swapped out Flambe for Walter, and finally managed to take down the Gyarados. All that stood between us and victory was Charizard, and all that stood between Charizard and victory was Perish Song, as although Walter could have easily taken our foe down with a Hydra Pump, I felt it was funnier to end things that way instead. And just like that, Champion Akechi had been defeated, and I had officially completed my first ever Pokemon Nuzlocke. I sure hope Akechi doesn't take this loss too hard and moves to Tokyo or something. But with that said, if you like what I'm doing here, subscribe, and as always, 